Don't you go taking away my Nginx. Ain't nobody got time for that. This episode is sponsored by Frontend Masters. They have a terrific lineup of live courses you can attend either online or in person. They also have a terrific backlog of courses you can watch, including JavaScript The Good Parts, Build Web Applications with Node.js, AngularJS in depth, and Advanced JavaScript. You can go check them out at frontendmasters.com. This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a thousand tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and LA bid on JavaScript developers, providing them with salary and equity up front. The average JavaScript developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary of $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they give you a $2,000 bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the JavaScript Jabber link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hired and get a $1,337 bonus if they accept the job. Go sign up at Hired.com slash JavaScript Jabber. This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the provider I use to host all of my creations. All the shows are hosted there, along with any other projects I come up with. Their user interface is simple and easy to use, their support is excellent, and their VPSs are backed on solid state drives and are fast and responsive. Check them out at DigitalOcean.com. If you use the code JavaScript Jabber, you'll get a $10 credit. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 192 of the JavaScript Jabber Show. This week on our panel, we have Jameson Dance. Hello, friends. Amy Knight. Hello. AJ O'Neill. Yo, 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 coming at you live from Portland. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv. A uh, quick reminder to go check out JS Remote Comp. Early bird tickets are now gone, but you can still sign up. And we should have the schedule up by the time this goes live. We have a special guest this week, and that is Peter Hottie. Hello, good to be here. Do you want to introduce yourself really quickly? I work at Marvell Semiconductor, which is a company that makes a lot of chips, and I run a, a team called Kenoma where, uh, that focuses on building software in JavaScript that runs on, of course, Marvell uh, Silicon, but also on all kinds of other open platforms. When you said make chips, I was so hoping it was potato chips. It'd be more fun. Yeah, more delicious. Mm -hmm. So what is Kenoma then? So Kenoma is a way to build application software for embedded devices in JavaScript. And so, you know, we, we've been as a, as a team been building, uh, software for hard, hardware companies for going on 15 years and kind of the traditional way that people build embedded, uh, which is now, I think, morphed into IoT has been in C and it just, you know, it doesn't scale very well and it takes forever and it's buggy and it never gets updated. And so what we found is by doing all of that in JavaScript, you know, you, you get all the benefits of, of the development tools people use on the web, the experience that people have built up on the web. And, and, you know, you can, you can just update things much more quickly, um, and make connections over the network much more easily, which is obviously essential to Internet of Things devices because they're, they're kind of defined by the fact that they have Internet connections. So having actually done some embedded programming in C, mm -hmm. I have to say that I definitely feel that pain in the sense that C isn't always the most approachable language. And I can also see the pain where with a lot of these embedded systems, the way that you test them is you put the program on the chip and then you run your program and you throw as much stuff at it as you can and you hope to get all the right information out the other side. How does JavaScript solve some of these problems? Well, you know, I think the first thing is you've got to get more people able to work on the software. You know, embedded development uh, in C is, is an incredibly difficult, challenging thing to do. You know, just getting the tools installed to work with the new chip can literally take weeks before they're working right. And um, I mean, I've seen this over and over and over again. And so what happens is there's only a handful of people who even can modify the software. Right, because they're the only ones who could get their system set up to build. The hardware is an incredibly short supply because you're building something new, um, and and so you just have 
you know, all these limitations that mean that there's just a few people who can really make any decisions about the software. Then you say, oh, yeah, but we have great product design teams and program managers who can define the product. And still, the person who controls the tools, the person who can actually change the code and make it run, has the final word in all the decisions, right? And so part of what we're really trying to do is just broaden it out so that more people can code. JavaScript is sort of intrinsically portable, right? It was designed for the web. It didn't grow up designed for any particular hardware architecture or operating system. So it's really portable by design. And what we do is we put our kind of core software on on a given piece of silicon, a given piece of hardware, and then people can script it just the way they script anything. And and it just allows a whole bunch more people to jump in and contribute to the product. So I have a couple, uh, I guess, background questions before we get too deep into the topic. You, you kind of mentioned Internet of Things and briefly defined it as devices connected to the Internet. That sounds really vague. Is there a way you can give more background into what exactly you mean by that? And then can you also talk more about um, what embedded systems are, if people aren't familiar with those terms? Sure. I, uh, you know, I think actually I've given you a more precise definition of Internet of Things than, than a lot of people do. Uh, but, but, but you're, you're absolutely right. It, it is very vague. And, and, you know, I think what's happening, if you kind of put it in a, in a historical perspective, you know, like a hundred and some odd years ago, we started putting electricity into everything, right? You know, people used to wash their clothes by hand and now we have electric dryers and washers. Everything, you know, we used to light candles and lanterns and now we have lights and it, the list goes on and on. And, We've reached this point where, you know, for the last 20 or 30 years, we've been putting digital into everything, right? You open up any product and there's a chip hiding in there somewhere. And that's become normal. But most of those products have still been standalone. And what's really changing with what people call IoT is that those devices are getting connected together through a network of one sort or another um, and getting their data onto the Internet. And the results of that are a little hard to predict. You know, we're, we're a little bit... I think too excited about kind of just remote control of existing categories of devices like thermostats and light bulbs um, and monitoring of data. You know, if we can collect all the data that ever happened, somehow we'll gain some insights that will help us 3%, be 3% more efficient. But I, you know, I think that's the first step, but I think IOT is really going to cause us to rethink whole device categories um, and, and rethink how we interact with the world because all of these things are going to be able to be connected and orchestrated together in ways that we can only begin to, to imagine. So I, I think that's what, what IoT means. And it is, you know, we're at the bleeding edge of it. So, you know, it is a little hard to give concrete examples. It's, you know, it's, it's like back at the dawn of the internet. Somehow everything came down to, all the examples came down to ordering pizza online. You know, and, and it, it just didn't seem like the internet was going to be that big a deal. It was just a better way to order pizza. And <laughs> I don't like pizza. It sounds like you know, the internet's not for me. Thunder bullet. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, but you know, somehow it, it actually did turn out to be a big deal and people found all sorts of great uses for that technology. So we're exploring that and embedded devices are really just the chips that are inside of those devices that we use, right? So it's typically small computers, right, a, a, a CPU with some sensors attached to it of one sort or another and, and some kind of, uh, you know, button. those sensors could be inputs like buttons or they could be, you know, like a temperature sensor or a, a light sensor. And then they have a, a network connection out to the rest of the world. And that's really embedded devices. And the challenge in programming them is that for cost reasons primarily, but also for size reasons and power consumption reasons, they tend to be very um, low powered, right? You know, our computers run at a gigahertz or more and have multiple cores in them these days, right? Uh, an embedded device, you know, runs at 200 megahertz or 50 megahertz or 8 megahertz, right? And so, and, and you know, an Arduino has 2K of RAM, you know, not two gigabytes of RAM. And so the challenges of making software work and work well in those sorts of environments are, are extremely high um, and require a, a kind of disciplined engineering that people aren't doing typically today on computers where there are so many rich resources available. I have one other question um, that kind of comes up along with this discussion. I hear a lot about mesh networks. Can you explain how that works? Uh, actually, I'm not a great mesh networking program. Not really great at explaining that. But I mean, the basic idea is is pretty simple and, and worth covering. You know, most of what we use with Wi-Fi today is uh, point to point, right? So it's your computer, your phone, your thermostat talking to a single access point, your your Wi-Fi access point. And the, the problem with that, and we've all experienced it, is that that connection depends on what's between those two 
points and how far apart they are, right? So a wall can be a big problem. You know, your backyard might be a big problem. You know, interference from your neighbor could be a big problem. Mesh networking basically lets lots of devices kind of be bridges to the next device. So it's not your one device connecting to a central point in your home, but it's all the devices kind of connecting together and relaying messages between them to get you better coverage and more reliable coverage. And people have implemented that in a number of different technologies, different radio technologies, um, and different configurations. But it, it's really designed to solve that problem of give you, giving you better reliability in terms of connections. Yeah, if I understand correctly, there's something I'm sure a lot of people have heard called dual bots. And I know that that's what it's using so that different people like these girls have like these bracelets and that's how they talk to each other. Right. Yeah, no, it's a great, um, I mean, it works well, in fact, when you have a situation where you may not have a central network, right? So for wearables where you're out in the world, if they can kind of all connect to each other without all having to have a cellular connection or carrying a Wi-Fi access point in your, in your pocket, that's a big win. So you touched briefly on how this relates to JavaScript and that JavaScript can be a candidate for, for a better language to do embedded programming in. Um, just because it's less susceptible to, I don't know, you, you can be more productive in it. You don't have to worry about seg faults most of the time. But you mentioned that these embedded devices are running at like 8 megahertz, right? That seems too low to, to run a JavaScript uh, VM. So how, how does JavaScript, I mean, there's some, Im, I don't know if they're embedded systems or not, but like Raspberry Pi is just a tiny little computer and you can run JavaScript on that because you can just build V8 for it or something. But how does JavaScript relate to these systems that are maybe too small to run JavaScript on? Well, so there's a couple things that are going on. One, uh, you're right, you know, at eight, eight megahertz and a couple K of RAM, JavaScript is probably like not the perfect solution. Um, and, and certainly a full JavaScript engine won't fit. As you kind of work your way up the food chain, you know, if you look at, at kind of IoT devices and things that are connected to the network, they aren't the devices that are running at eight, at eight megahertz because you just can't sustain a Wi-Fi connection and, you know, TCP IP and all that stuff credibly at eight, at eight megahertz. And so the device Devices that are really driving IoT are much more beefy. I'd say 50 megahertz at the bottom and 100 to 200 megahertz is more common. And those devices really can run JavaScript. At the low end of that, they may be running a subset, uh, which is unfortunate, but it's okay. But by the time you hit kind of 150, 200 megahertz, with not that much RAM, less than a megabyte, you can run a, a full JavaScript stack and run it well. And, you know, if you kind of project out a little bit, those kinds of, of CPUs are, are very cost effective and, and make good sense to put inside of uh, IoT products. Um, they're going inside them today and they're going to go inside a lot more as time progresses. So, you know, I, I'll agree with you that it's, it's a little bit bleeding edge to be doing JavaScript on IoT devices. But, you know, that's the time to work on it and kind of explore it and figure out the right way to use it. Because, um, you know, a year from now, two years from now, it's going to be, you know, a mainstream sort of thing in terms of hardware capabilities. And so, you know, this is a good time to get ready for it well new javascript engine that maybe you recall the name of it it's it's something that runs like 200k of ram or something like that and it's for iot do you, do you well, know what i'm talking about i know we have one that almost meets that requirement <laughs> so there, there's several people who are working on them in various forms there, there's a number of subsets that are available my team has built a, a javascript engine called xs6 um, just the letters X, S, and the number six for sixth edition of JavaScript. Um, and it runs on, um, you know, a part that our, our employer makes, um, which has a half a megabyte of RAM and runs very well there with the, with the full language. There are other people, um, there's several good examples out there uh, of people doing similar kinds of things um, at various points along the chain. Nobody's using, um, though, for example, Node or the kinds of engines you see in web browsers. Um, and that's because they were really engineered to be blazingly fast when you have a lot of memory available. And for IoT, for the kinds of devices we're talking about, you just don't have the RAM. And so the, the priority is really on getting to a good functional set of information, uh, a good functional implementation that can work under the constraints of those devices. So the, the one I was talking about is called duct tape. I just looked it up. Also, okay. in a similar vein, have you heard of, well, I mean, you're familiar with Lua, of course. Have you heard of Love It? No, not that one. That is, Lua and Lovett are used by some of the Kickstarter projects that claim to run JavaScript on the hardware. Uh -huh. They actually transpile from JavaScript to Lua, 
because Lua is a smaller footprint. It's almost the exact same API as JavaScript with a few minor differences that are pretty easy to account for. And you so, know, uh, it's true. A lot of people are using Lua and, you know, it was designed to be smaller. I think that the transpiling solutions that we've looked at, and I, I don't know the specific ones you're, you're referring to, but a, a lot of times they're, they're really not the full language or close to it. And that starts to be a problem from what, what we've experienced because one of the things that we think is really important is to be able to tap the, uh, the experience people have working in Node and working on the web. And if the language behaves in subtly different ways, it can be very frustrating to kind of understand those differences and, and keep kind of two working sets in your brain like that. So those things work. I mean, Lua is great because of its small size. When you start transpiling in, you do start to run into, into subtle problems that can create real challenges. I don't know. Yeah. JavaScript developers are used to all the different browser quirks. So <laughs> I mean, we're, we're used to the suffering of just supporting lots of like unoverlapping subsets of the language. Well, and the language itself is kind of, it purports to have some properties that are similar to OO and some properties that are similar to functional programming and some of it, you know, the prototypal inheritance is funky and, you know, so, so we get used to kind of the oddities that make up JavaScript. Now I'm not saying they're not powerful features. I'm just saying <laughs> that some of them are kind of weird. No, I mean, and no question about it. I think one of the great things that's going on with JavaScript though is it's uh it's an incredibly alive language. The group of people who are working on on evolving the language are are aware of exactly what you're talking about. You know, the prototype based inheritance is kind of charmingly eccentric, you know, and, mm -hmm. and a bunch of us have kind of I like the way you put it. that. Yeah, I, a lot of us have gotten used, used to using it, but, you know, the folks working on JavaScript said, okay, maybe it's time. And so they added a class keyword to sixth edition. And that's something that's being rolled out into all the major engines. I, I think you'll see over the next year. Um, it's something we already support in our XS6 engine. And that lets people use more conventional class based syntax and inheritance. The cool thing is that they did it in a backwards compatible way. So it can coexist with and really just builds on top of the prototype based inheritance. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's, it's actually great. The people working on the language are incredibly responsive to extending it in ways that meet the needs of the community and the challenges, right? Another place where people have had all sorts of challenges is um, kind of with callbacks and these pyramids of doom, you know, of callbacks inside of callbacks inside of callbacks. And um, that's gotten cleaned up significantly with the addition of promises to the language in sixth edition. And that came out of a lot of the work that went on in Node in particular, but also in terms of things people did on the web. Web. Yeah, I mean, I think JavaScript programmers, you're right, some of them have gotten, uh, the better ones for sure, have, have gotten used to dealing with the quirks. But I don't think that's a plus. You know, I mean, I think that's something that, yeah, that, that we should that be striving to get into. Like, no, no, I understand. I hopefully understand. You, you don't need to deal with the quirks. Yeah. Yeah. One thing so, that I'm, I'm wondering, though, is do you see JavaScript moving into some of the other Internet of Things areas? It, it looks like Jewelbots maybe. Uh, Amy, does it have a JavaScript interface? Is that her? You know what? I'm not sure. I don't think so, but I could be wrong. But do you see people, I mean, besides the Raspberry Pi running node and things like that, the Arduinos that run JavaScript, do you see people out there writing embedded systems in JavaScript? Or is that only on the platform that you're providing them? And what are they doing with it? Oh, no, there's all sorts of people playing with it. I don't think there's a huge number of systems in deployment yet, but I, I see lots of people exploring it. There's, I can't remember the name of the engine, but there was one for the, um, th that actually runs on one of the Wi-Fi chips that's really popular right now. That was an interesting subset of JavaScript that, that had been brought up. You know, we see a lot of people because they're so focused on the connectivity, right? What does the web speak for data these days? It's all JSON, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it makes a lot of sense to, to write your code in the, in the same language as your data, right? So that, that you can just manipulate that stuff seamlessly. And so it doesn't take long for people who give it a try to understand that, that it's a, it's a really natural way to build stuff. I think the, the challenge is kind of getting the word out there. And so I'm happy to have the opportunity here, um, to, to talk with you guys today about it. Um, but you know, we've had JavaScript powered embedded devices, um, out in the world. Uh, I mean, for years, Marvell unfortunately has really tight confidentiality policy. So I can't talk about like, most of the, the things we're doing here, which is horrible, but I can talk about one that we did years ago with Sony back even before the Kindle was like a thing. Um, we shipped a, a completely JavaScript powered ebook solution with Sony, their Sony reader. And everything, the entire UI of that, all the content management was all done in JavaScript and worked exceedingly well. 
You know, to those people who say, oh, JavaScript's too slow, you know, the funny thing is Sony had a version of that product in Japan before that we did the JavaScript version for them for the U.S. And the performance of the JavaScript version was much better than the performance of the version for Japan that was written completely in C. And, you know, so the lesson there is, yeah, you can write slow C code and you can write fast JavaScript code. And it's, it's not the language so much that's the, the factor as, as the engineers and kind of their dedication to getting it right. So, you know, part of our goal is to get people out there just to give this a, to give this a try so that they can see what's possible and kind of get it into their thinking um, as they, you know, t- tackle new projects moving forward. So a lot of people probably, if they're not already familiar with this, I think a lot of people are really interested in getting started. Do you have, I guess, kind of like advice on that? And one big question, how much about electrical engineering do I need to know before I start getting into this? I've done a little bit with Arduino, and I know that it takes a fair amount of effort for kind of a small payoff at first, like just to get a little LED lit lit up or something. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit of work, but it's not too bad. One of the things that we've been doing with our products, we have a, a, a kind of a prototyping device called Kenoma Create that has a touchscreen built in and Wi-Fi. And of course, it runs our engine, our JavaScript engine. And, you know, we, we try to address some of exactly what you're saying, which is how can we get people started without, you know, them having to do a huge amount of work in, in the first step. And so, you know, one of the things we built into it was a little app called Pin Explorer. And it's, it's a GUI app that runs on the touchscreen. So you don't even have to write any code to start using it. And you can literally, you know, plug in a button or plug in an LED and just manipulate it with the, with the app. So you can turn the light on and off, make sure your wiring's correct, get the, get the thing to blink. You can graph, you know, the input from a temperature sensor or a pressure sensor and see it on screen and know that it works. And then kind of move to the next step, which is to write some simple code that, that works with it. And, you know, what we've found for anybody getting started is the hardest thing is to be faced with, you know, an empty document, you know, foo.js in their text editor. And then they're like, what do I type? And so the best way to learn isn't to write something from scratch. It's to take something that works and, you know, either try to make it better or break it. Oh, and man, so, it's taken me so long to learn that lesson. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I feel like I have this weird, like need to figure out how everything works before I write a line of code. And then I just don't get anything done. Uh-huh. I do like a depth first search of the docs. And then I'm reading about like, uh-huh. a, I don't know, AVL trees and in some internal implementation. I haven't written anything yet. So I, I really like that approach to just like getting people breaking stuff as soon as they can. Yeah. So, you know, we have um, up on our GitHub site, we have like, I mean, over a hundred examples, you know, uh, I think 50 or 60 of them use different sensors and components and stuff. And so you can, you know, order the same parts we use, pull down our code um, and just run it on the device, see how it works. And then, you know, start breaking stuff, start gluing pieces together and, and see what's there. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's how that's, that's really the best way to learn because you're not wrestling with 13 different things at the same time. So more of my questions, but these are when you get further along, much more advanced, probably people. I have a friend who works at a company and they do like thermostats and such. What? So this is definitely way more advanced. But what is it like testing for devices like that? Because I know it's definitely very different than like testing software because you have a lot of like outside influences you have to account for, like heat or things like that. Yeah, it's it's a good question. You know, I, I think um, one of the things that we we believe in a lot are the use of simulators because you know you you can't like you said you can't test heat conditions all the time, right? I mean, you can't carry around a blowtorch in a refrigerator to test all the time. And so um, one of the things that we provide as part of our developer tools is a simulator for the device that you're targeting, and we provide simulators for all of the components that we uh, that we support directly, right? So if you're using temperature sensor XYZ, you can run that temperature sensor on your computer, and you have sliders and knobs and buttons or whatever so that you can see. And if it's like an output, you know, like a light, you can have have a graph of the intensity level or whatever. And so you can test all these circumstances, you know, in your scripts on your computer and and then you can pull that stuff over to the device and run it there. And of course you do need to do, you know, the real world testing of all that that stuff, but it's it's a big difference how much you can test with a simulator and how quickly you can do that versus how much, you know, if you're actually using the real world sensors. The other kinds of things you can do is you can, you know, in a simulator, you could uh, like record the data from a real world run and then play it back 
right, to see how it behaves so that you've got the data. And there are services that will let you do that. I think Adafruit's building out a repository of um, sensor data for people to be able to do those kinds of things, for example. So, you know, you've got to take a little bit of a different approach, but it's not that radically different, right? In the world of unit testing and mocks and all that stuff that people are using with different development methodologies, they're doing a lot of these same things. They're just using those those kind of proxies to represent typically like a web service that they don't want to have to talk to directly. And we're, we're just applying that same idea, but to sensors and actuators and things like that. I guess final question then about this kind of thing is just on security, especially like, you know, I've read a little bit and have like a very high level understanding about like how mesh networks work. And it seems like that is like a huge gaping hole. And it just seems like maybe security is not something that people are horribly focused on right now, but seems like it could be a problem. And AJ, you'd probably be a great person to talk about this too. Well, I know that there's a lot of those uh, little home automation things that people don't utilize the security on them because the security features are optional. And that makes me scared. And we've seen things with like cars and where cars, people have done hacks where they put on the brakes. All of those have been in controlled environments and by white hat hackers, not by malicious people, as far as I've heard in the news. But I think that security is something that people need to consider very carefully when they're putting something in their home because it's in their home and that's an important place. Yeah, I mean, I think there's kind of two aspects to security, you know, and you're, I, I think you're touching on one, which is, you know, people have to use the security features that are built into the products, right? And, and that's, it's easy to say, but it's harder to do because, um, technology tends to have a lot of options and not everyone understands the implications of all those options. Right. So, you know, turning off password protection on your device is obviously not the best idea, but, you know, people will turn on options related to port forwarding on their network and, and not understand that that just opened up a hole, right, that a hacker could exploit to get into their network, for example. Um, so finding good clear ways in the in the way the product is is used and presents itself so people can make smart choices is important. And th- that's sort of the easy side, unfortunately. I mean, it's not a lot of people get it wrong, but that's the easy side. The, the harder side is, is hardening the platform, right? So from malicious attacks, because, you know, you know, we, we see all of the security updates to, you know, Android and, and iOS and Windows and, you know, Microsoft and, and Google and Apple are pretty good at the security thing and, and they have plenty of holes, right? And so, you know, if you're kind of, you know, small company XYZ building a, a product, can you reasonably think you're going to, you're going to beat that? And so I think part of the challenge is not, is understanding that, that you have to invest in, and build on top of platforms that are reasonably secure and hardened to begin with so that they're not, you know, intrinsically unbelievably hackable. And you have to take care on those things. And, you know, I think one of the things, just, you know, coming back to why JavaScript is, is good for this, uh, somebody, I, sorry, I forgot who now mentioned it earlier, is, you know, you don't have to worry about seg faults, right? You don't have to worry about it crashing because if it's written correctly, if it's, if it's a good implementation, it shouldn't crash. And, you know, most, uh, a huge fraction of the security exploits, if you just read the Apple notes every time they post another one, are, you know, an application not dealing with badly formed data correctly, right? And that creates a crash. Somebody feeds an invalid JPEG into Safari and all of a sudden they can take over your computer. In JavaScript, you know, if you're, if you're working in that language, in theory, that should never happen. And so you gain, just by choice of language, you gain some resiliency, some robustness from security. And everybody believes, of course, that when they write their C code, they never have any flaws that will lead to crashes ever. But it's, it's never true. They're just, you know, they're not looking skeptically enough at their own code. We all, we all make those mistakes. And so that's why building on something that's, that's secure and solid is a really, really important thing to do because security can't be uh, an afterthought. It really has to be baked in as kind of the ongoing process of the product. And I want to say the thing that makes security hard is that it it requires knowledge. It's not like the things that you have to do are particularly hard. I mean, the hard problems have been solved. The encryption, the, you know, symmetric encryption and asymmetric, the key signing, like there's libraries for all that stuff. Sometimes it's a little harder to find web versions of those libraries, but there's libraries of all that stuff and, and they work and those are solved problems. The hard stuff is like making sure that when you're, 
checking for the existence of something that you don't assume that if something isn't true, that it's false. Because in JavaScript, if it's undefined, you don't get an error. So you have to be really careful about the way you check your conditions. And then you just have to be generally aware of security practices, like using a constant time string compare if you need a string compare for some sort of hash, and as opposed to using the triple equals, which triple equals runs, you know, if there's eight characters and only two of the match, it checks two characters. With a constant time string compare, it'll check all eight characters no matter what, so that you can't get a timing attack. I mean, there's there's stuff like that where it's not it's not hard. It's just you mm-hmm. have to have the knowledge, right? And and I mean, I think that's you know comes back to um, you know people underestimate the the challenge of security. You know, a, a lot of people um, who use JavaScript will you know readily confess that they don't fully understand the language and haven't read the full spec. And, and you know, it's fair enough. It's it's a, it's a lot to digest, and you can be a good user of the technology without having to understand everything about it. But you know, security is maybe even harder with that regard. You know, it, I mean, the concepts are fairly sophisticated. You you know, when you start reading about Alice and Eve and all that stuff, it's easy to quickly get lost. And so you really do need to have people uh, who are kind of thinking about security first constantly and are aware of all the kinds of things you talk about. Um, you know, the other thing, of course, which is important is to be able to kind of fall back to stuff that's baked into the hardware, right? So, you know, a, a lot of hardware has secure boot. A lot of hardware these days has cryptographic primitives built into it and can be executed in hardware, which helps with performance, but also makes it, you know, more or less impossible for somebody to hack the implementation of those security primitives, right? And so being able to connect to and take advantage of those services that are built into the hardware can also help to harden the implementation against all kinds of different attacks. So this is a something I've been thinking about during the show, and it, it might not come out articulately, but I've been thinking about Bootstrap and how you could make decent looking sites before bootstrap but it kind of opened up decent looking sites to a whole new class of people who maybe didn't have the skill or the time or the inclination to put all all the work into designing something and there's some negatives to it right like bootstrap sites can look cookie cutter and there's some weird technical issues you can run into if you like edit the css directly and things like that so it's not all positive but for for people that aren't maybe design experts it's sort of lowered the barrier to building something that looked good. It it seems like that's kind of what's happening with JavaScript and and IoT, where there might be things you can do in C that you couldn't do in JavaScript right now or or maybe ever. But just by virtue of so many more people being able to build stuff, you'll get new things that you wouldn't get if the only people who could build IoT stuff were were the grizzled C hackers, you know. Does that make sense? No, I think it's exactly right. And, uh, you know, I think some of the most creative work is being done on the web, right? You know, I mean, and, and done quickly, right? You know, when there's, there's a natural disaster that happens, you know, within like an hour, there's websites, you know, that are popping up to support it, right? The people who build the web know how to move quick, know how to execute things and just have ideas and the energy and the passion to make it happen. And that's a, they're just moving at a different speed and with different assumptions than people who have built embedded hardware. And so, you know, I, I, I'm one of the people who, who's built embedded hardware, so I have nothing against them at all. Um, but, you know, I think that's, it's, that skill set is not the end of what, of the skills that you need anymore. Right. That's still what you need at the bottom of the stack. But but there's additional layers that are now on the stack that can be scriptable and that can let uh, a lot more people dive in. You know, I, I think it's also I mean, it changes in terms of education. You know, we're we did an after school program here at Marvell for through the fall, 10 weeks with a bunch of students in kind of fourth, fifth and sixth grade um, and taught them a little bit of programming and, and a little bit of uh, wiring, Amy, you know, with, uh, without having to teach them electrical engineering so they could connect stuff together. And, you know, they had a great time. The, the language doesn't get in the way. We did some work in Blockly so that they could even escape the syntax so that they could kind of visually program their way through. And And, you know, they were able to get some simple things to work. And more importantly than that, they were able to walk away from it feeling confident that they kind of understood how the tools will work and could control them and that they could learn how to do more. And I I think that's really important. You know, there's so many people who used to be pure graphic designers and who would rely on programmers to build stuff for them back, you know, before the web was a big deal. And those graphic designers picked up basic JavaScript programming skills or more and are able to, you know, do whole websites now themselves. And so that broadening of the base, letting more people into play 
is going to bring new ideas, new energy, and um, you know, new efficiencies to the industry. And that's important because what we're trying to do with these devices, we're expecting them to do so much more than they used to. Do you find any resistance in the existing community? I feel like whenever you're part of a community for a while and it's kind of difficult to get into, and then suddenly it becomes a lot easier, a lot more accessible, there can be this tendency to be to like, like poo-poo the people that came in after as you know, the lightweights who couldn't hack it back in the good old days and stuff. <laughs> um, do you, do you see any, any of that kind of thing with like JavaScript embedded stuff is, is not the real embedded systems or whatever? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm at a company that has, I don't know, 6,000 employees, most of whom have electrical engineering degrees. So um, you can imagine, you know, what some of those conversations can be like. But, you know, the, the flip side is there's a lot of electrical engineers, um, a lot of kind of traditional embedded engineers who know that their strength is not on the higher level software parts. You know, they do it, but they know they're not awesome at it. They do it to get the job done. And they, they're, a lot of them are open to tools that will, will help them do a better job. They're skeptical. They're not just going to like start using them and bet their life on it without testing it and, you know, working through it and, and making sure that it really can do what they need. But they're open to it. And, you know, I think, again, if you look, you know, we're at a transition point, right? This is definitely not mainstream yet. Um, but if you look down the road five years, you know, the electrical engineers are going to have gone through school learning JavaScript, right? So it's going to be, and the hardware is going to run it really well. And so it's not going to be like a, a radical choice. It's just going to be natural. And so that's, that's, you know, that's why we're betting on it now because we know what it can do. And uh, we, we want to get people excited about it and, and, and just trying it um, so they can see for themselves. So you've kind of given a little bit of a picture of where you think Internet of Things from the engineering standpoint is going to go. Where do you see Internet of Things going in the future as far as applications go? It seems like things are getting smaller and people keep talking about healthcare and they talk about, you know, some of the home automation stuff that we're talking about or other things. I mean, where, where do you think it's going to explode next? Yeah, it's an interesting challenge. You know, you need the ideas. It's not a question of building the hardware so much. We can build all kinds of cool and amazing things. It's building things that people want, and it's building things that work reliably enough that you can deploy them at scale, right? I mean, there's still not any particular IoT device that, you know, you can kind of drop ship to, you know, your parents' house and, and have it work reliably, right? You got to go set it up. And so we've, we've got work to do there. The other thing, and, and a bunch of reporters wrote about this last year after CES, is um, that IoT kind of promises all your devices can communicate with each other and they're all, they'll all be connected. And we've all read kind of the, you know, the dreamy, starry-eyed articles about it. But the practical reality is really different. Most devices can't talk to each other. Uh, right. And you've got all these different companies building all their own kind of private ecosystems. You know, it's it's popular to, to pick on Apple in that regard uh, with HomeKit. Uh, but, you know, Google has at least one, if not several initiatives in that area. Samsung's made investments. Um, you know, everybody's got kind of their idea of this is how IoT should work. And if everybody connects to our cloud, then everything can talk to each other. And that's not how things take off. It's got to be much more open and interconnected in a way that somebody with a good idea can connect these different devices together. Not, you know, if Apple says it's okay or Google says it's okay. And so, you know, a, a big part of what I think is exciting about putting scriptability onto these devices is that potential for, for kind of much higher interconnection. Um, and lots of other, lots of people bringing their own ideas to it. You know, we've been talking about scriptability uh, so far today as, as a tool for developers to create their IoT products, right? But what if we take a step back and say, actually, what scriptability is going to be even more important for is for end users to build apps for, you know, for startups to build apps that run on other people's hardware. You know, that's what made the computer industry huge, right? Was apps. That's what made mobile take off like crazy. It was apps. And why wouldn't it be the same for IoT, where we can bring all of the different ideas, all the great ideas of different people together, you know, people who can make connection devi between devices and hours by uploading new code to it, rather than us having to convince, you know, the manufacturer to let us, to not even to let us, convince the manufacturer to make a connection to the products of their competitors, 
right? Like they're not going to do that for you. And so I think scriptability has the potential to be the thing that makes IoT take off, that gives IoT the flexibility and the nimbleness and the inclusiveness that people expect from all the digital things in their, in their world. So the way you're talking about this, and you kind of mentioned how everything connects to a proprietary cloud, but the way you're talking about this is the way that I talk to business people and clients about the cloud. So what you're saying is that this scriptability is what allows people then to run their programs on other people's devices. So does the new cloud then become IoT? Some people say so. I'm not as certain. I, you know, I, I think there's, you know, we talked about privacy and security, right? What's the best way to keep the data inside your home private from people around the world? It, it's to never let it outside your home, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, if I want my front door to notice when I come in and, you know, turn on the heat and turn on the lights, why should I go to the cloud for that? Well, because Google believes the cloud should get everything is not like a great answer. And so, you know, maybe that's the right architecture. I, I'm not saying yes or no, but but I, I do think we should engineer the devices. So that's a choice that a user can make, you know, that a product designer can make that's not globally made. So we have that level of control. Um, if it all goes to the cloud or a big chunk of it goes to the cloud, so be it, if that's the right answer. But I, I don't think we know that yet. Um, and you do have these off the grid kind of circumstances where there is no cloud, right? And we still want everything to work or the cloud's very slow because you just don't have great latencies to it from where you are, right? And so, you know, I think building things in an open way where we can explore all of those different possible futures and, and kind of their intersections rather than banking uh, in advance on, on one particular architecture is a, is a much better way to proceed. Sounds like AJ has some thoughts on this. I wholeheartedly agree. I feel very, very strongly about this topic. That is our entire business, definitely. I mean, we don't have a product yet, but I wish that I could tell you about some of the things that are in the works right now. But I, I, one, one variance is I, I do believe that the right approach is not to have Google in control of our door locks. I definitely <laughs> believe that that is not the solution. No, the but NSA. I, <laughs> but I, I believe that they're, um, that the whole thing about you know, a uh, common architecture, scriptability, interconnection. And that's, that's something that with the OAuth3 protocol we're working on, we want devices to be able to, to authorize against each other and that kind of thing. And, and it, it, with the, the movements like unhosted, re-decentralize, trying to think of a couple of the other buzzwords that are springing up right now. But this, this idea of the Nextornet, the peer web is definitely on the rise. Mm -hmm. So I guess the next question is, if this is what's coming or if something like it is coming, because we can never exactly predict, what, predict what's going to come, how do developers today prepare for the tomorrow where we have all of these enabled devices? You know, I think developers today can do more than prepare. You know, I, I think it's part of what's made IoT so exciting and why, you know, far too many of us spend too much time on Kickstarter and Indiegogo kind of like looking at the latest in advances is that hardware manufacturing, um, making new devices has, has changed. You know, it used to be even, even as, as recently as a decade ago that only Sony, you know, and, and a handful of companies could make really high quality consumer electronics products, right? The, the, the effort involved, the access to the supply chain and the manufacturing was incredibly restricted. And that's changed, right? You know, with not that much money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, you can do a run of a, of a very credible consumer electronics product. And so we don't have to just prepare for what Samsung's going to bring next. We don't have to prepare for like the next big thing there, or, you know, Apple's next idea, which will all be great and fascinating and beautiful and well done. But we can bring our own ideas together, right? We can get a Raspberry Pi or a Kenoma Create or an Arduino, and we can make a device which is as open as we think it should be. And we can put that out there and share it. And we can, you know, help as a startup pitch that to a larger company to bring to market and make those ideas possible and just start planting those ideas in, in the air. You know, it was so funny. I was working with Sony really closely years ago, and um, they were starting to put Wi-Fi in their products as a way to, to access the web. And I, I was promoting the idea of, oh, you could put a server inside like a device. And, you know, every engineer was like, you're crazy. Why would you even want to do that? And I'm like, well, you could get your photos off your device more easily. And no, they're like, you're nuts. And then like three years later, some product designer showed up and he says, we've had this amazing, crazy idea. You're never going to believe it. It's so awesome. He's like, we're going to put a server inside a camera. 
And I was like, oh, you're brilliant. That is such a good idea. And, you know, and the idea had entered the air at Sony. And, and, you know, I'm not saying I'm the only person who ever thought of it, but it entered the idea and it had gone from being radical and you're an insane to, oh, yeah, we're going to do this. And it's awesome. And so you've got to you've got to get out there. And, you know, independent developers, people who love to explore and try things can not only prepare for that future, but can help shape what it can be by showing showing what's possible. Right. And they can vote with their dollars. Right. Um, when we did our Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign, we said we were going to open source a bunch of the, the stuff that was there. And we actually had several people who said, OK, we'll all like f- support you when like I can browse your GitHub repository and see that you're starting to put stuff in there. And so we did, you know, and it was just a good forcing function that took our good intention. And somebody said, yeah, I'll, I'll give you money if you'll actually like make that real. And so we can make choices that encourage the right decision. You know, Cory Doctorow, speaking at O'Reilly Solid this year, said, look, we give all this money to Apple and Google and Samsung and Microsoft for their products, and they're wonderful, and we use them, and we get good value for it. So we're not going to stop. Um, you know, we're not all Richard Stallman. But what if we just took 10% of our spend to those companies on their kind of semi-open or closed products and committed it to causes that were open, right, to places, to products that are open source, to organizations that are promoting interoperability um, or the open hardware movement, just to help nurture that along because it, because we know it matters. And I thought that was a great perspective where, you know, we can, we can have our cake and, and eat it too or something. So I, I think they're really positive steps we can take from where we are today to kind of help bring about a future that, that's more the way we want to see it, which is a long way to go from starting about JavaScript, but what a, what a great conversation. Yeah, this has been really great. Have, have there been topics that you wanted to cover that we didn't really? I feel like we kind of, we covered how to get started, why you care, kind of the, the history of it and where you think it's going. Is there anything, anything you want to cover? No, I mean, anything I left? think... The, the big thing is I just, um, I, I think people should try. You know, I, I think, you know, again, to Amy's comment about it, it, about kind of, do you have to be an electrical engineer? You know, I think that's one of the, the things when we started, um, with Kenoma Create that we tried to address. We put a case around our prototyping kit. So it, it kind of looks friendly and you don't have to worry about breaking it or getting electrocuted or, or, you know, any of those things. And, um, for a lot of people that, that was a, big deal. Like that made the device more approachable for them, right? You know, you go back to the, um, you know, the old Apple one, Apple two, way, way back at the dawn of the microcomputer, right? Before those things, there was no case around computers. They were all bare breadboards, right? And so you've got to kind of take some steps to bring people in and the people who are already there, you know, like you asked, some of them are going to say, oh yeah, that's not hardcore. That's, you know, that's making it too easy for people, but it's great. Why not? Right. Like, let's get more people in. We're living in a world that is populated by digital devices. It makes sense to have some facility, some comfort level, some understanding of how those things work um, and some belief that you can do some things yourself. Um, I love that. Sorry, I just wanted to chime in that I do really love that. I think or at least I hope that there's a place for people. You know, I think uh, as with software, there's a lot of people coming in who have not been exposed to this. I definitely was never exposed to this up until like programming in general, up until a couple of years ago. And if nothing else, like the little bit of playing around with hardware that I have done has taught me some things that younger in life just weren't really pushed to learn. So it's exciting. <laughs> You know, it's fun and it really gives you a sense that, that you have a, a better understanding of how all these things that work, that, you know, that you're using every day um, and, that, and that you can contribute to that in some, some way. I think it's a big deal. All right, then before we get to the picks, I just want to acknowledge our silver sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Thinkful.com. Thinkful.com is the largest community of students and mentors. They offer one-on-one mentoring, live workshops, and expert career advice. If you're looking to build a career in front-end, back-end, or full stack development, then go check them out at thinkful.com. This episode is sponsored by TrackJS. Let's face it, errors cost you money. You lose customers, server resources, and time to them. Wouldn't it be nice if someone told you how and when they happen so you could fix them before they cost you big time? You may have this on your backend application code, but what about your front end JavaScript? It's time to check out TrackJS. It tracks errors and usage and helps you find bugs before your customers even report them. Go check them out at trackjs.com slash jsjabber. AJ, do you want to start us off with picks? Uh, I'm going to do a shameless plug because that's the coolest thing I can do right now. But no, no, I'll, I'll do it tandem. Let's Encrypt has launched. It works. You can go out and get certificates. The testing server will issue certificates to you all day long. These are SSL certificates for free that we're talking about, right? And 
we have released a node library for Let's Encrypt. And the one that's on the GitHub right now as of yesterday is a wrapper for the Python client. But as of two hours from now, we will have the node, the pure node implementation, a CLI implementation for Express, like all that stuff. I'm just almost done with it. So let's encrypt. Awesome. And, so, uh, so on a release schedule, two hours from now means a couple weeks ago. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> It'll be awesome by then. There's already like people that have made contributions and stuff. Like it's Let's Encrypt is so hot right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Did I cut you off? Or did you have more picks? Okay. Who needs sleep? <laughs> Just stay awake. Staying awake is my other pick. All right. I tried that today and <laughs> it's it's caused problems. Yeah, I, it's I'm the reason I'm... that her diaper was on upside down for a while. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yep. I, I could say the same thing about the 60-year-old that I was up with all night. So, <laughs> Anyway, Jameson, what are your picks? I just have one. I recently had a uh, kind of like the come-to-Jesus moment with accessibility. I, I've always heard that it's been good and felt that little guilt in my heart that I, that I didn't know how to do it right. And we had a meeting with a client who was very motivated to help us improve our accessibility. It was, it was uh, pretty rough <laughs> in the moment. But it made me just like suck it up and do it. Uh, I'm I'm not amazing at it, but yeah, I guess this is a, a poorly told story that sums up with a link that popped up in my Twitter feed the other day. Just a really good overview of the very basics of accessibility. And and having talked to someone that cares about this a lot and knows about this a lot, this aligns really well with their advice. So uh, it's just a blog post called The Web Accessibility Basics. So that's my only pick. All right, Amy, what are your picks? So the first one I have is a hangout that someone named Eric Isaacson is doing. I'm not sure if other people are involved, but it's called Read the Source, which they do exactly that. So he picks a bunch of like popular open source libraries, or he did one with Node Streams, and they have the developers who wrote the source code or work on the open source projects go through all the code. Uh, so that is my pick. It's I think it's called opensource.io. I will put a link in the show notes. And the Never heard I, of it. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to pick, I guess, like, I don't know. I was playing around with stuff this weekend, as I always do, and um, it just got me thinking that as a newer programmer, a lot of people, they start you off with OOP. And so I just want to encourage any newer programmers that are listening, if you haven't looked at um, more functional programming, to go ahead and start doing that because I feel like the stuff that I've done so far has helped me just write cleaner code in general. So that is my other pick. All right. So I was being a smart aleck. I I was on Read the Source a few months ago. So Awesome. I think I saw that when I was looking at the website. I know they're like going through the Angular 2 source in a couple weeks. Um, like I said, the Node Streams one was really, really good. So I just think it's an awesome concept. Yeah. Yeah, it just takes some time to prep. So they, I don't think they do it every week. But Yeah. I think they're doing Elm too in a couple of weeks. So Very cool. That would be awesome. All right. I've got a couple of picks. This all ties together. I have been working on reworking the emails that go out for the shows. If you didn't know, you can get emails about the episodes when they come out in your inbox. And I know some people use that to kind of screen through and figure out which ones they want to listen to and which ones they don't. And they like having a little more information than just the title. And so they go and they subscribe and then they get an email every week that says, hey, there's a new JavaScript Jabber. Here's here are the show notes and here's the title and all the other stuff. I'm reworking that a little bit. I'm also going to be sending out an email every week that's just my thoughts about something that has to do with programming or business or something like that. It'll relate to programming in one way or another, but it may relate more to a career than to technology some of the time. Anyway, so I've been using Drip for that. You can get it at getdrip.com. It's an awesome tool if you're doing any kind of email marketing. It allows you to set up uh, email sequences, Drip sequences. It allows you to subscribe people and tag them. It allows you to send broadcasts, which is how those uh, RSS, uh, it hooks into the RSS feed and pulls all the information out. And it's just, it's awesome. It works great. So uh, I'm a fan of Drip. The other thing that I'm going to be doing, and in fact, I already have the phone number purchased on Twilio, but I'm going to set up a text in number so that if you're listening on the, you know, wherever you're at, 
you can actually text in and get subscribed to that list. Uh, the phone number is 7656 coding is the only word I could find that was in there. So seven seven six five six two six three four six four. If you text in JavaScript, then it will uh, ask for your email address, and then you'll start getting those emails. So I'm super happy with that. Twilio is working out great for that. And then I'm just pulling together a dirty little Rails app that does all the rest of the work. So, yeah, so I'm going to pick those. And then just another quick reminder, JavaScript, uh, JS Remote Conf. So if you want tickets, if you want to come, uh, we have AJ speaking and Amy speaking and super excited about that. Aaron Frost, who used to be on the show, is speaking. John Papa is doing a quick introduction to Angular. Uh, I'm talking to some people to get some React content in there. And I've been talking to Elijah Manor as well about coming in and doing a talk. So just to give you some ideas, and I will have the schedule up probably a week before this one comes out. So go check it out. It'll definitely be out before the holiday hits. So anyway, uh, go check that out and get a ticket. You can also get users group tickets or you can get corporate tickets, uh, which cost the same. They just work a little bit differently. So if you want those, you can get them as well. And while you're at it, go to allremoteconfs.com and check out all of the conferences this year. We have them on Git, Postgres, Newbies, Robots, which is kind of related to IoT. Anyway, so go check all those out. You can actually get packages of tickets and that's actually cheaper than buying even on the early bird. So anyway, I'll quit talking about my stuff. I'm just excited about it all. Peter, what are your picks? Okay, I'm going to do three quick ones if that's okay. Yep. Uh, in the spirit of read the source, since this is a uh, JavaScript uh, discussion, I'm going to encourage people to actually like occasionally take a look at the JavaScript specification, uh, ES262, uh, yeah, ECMA262. And, you know, don't read all 1500 pages, but, you know, if you're ever having a question about how some part of the language should actually work, You'll, you'll discover it's much more readable than you think, um, with a little bit of practice. And, you know, why not look at the source document, origin document of the, the language that you're working in? It's, it's a really great way to learn. That's one. Two, we've been talking a lot about kind of open devices and why that's important and what it means. There's a fantastic book. It's, it's, uh, it's from a few years back now, back when the iPhone was taking off called The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. And it's by a a Harvard uh, law professor named Jonathan Zittrain. And it's an unbelievably detailed kind of history of how the personal computer really relied on open software and how kind of with phones at the time he wrote it, that was becoming at risk. And if you look at IoT um, today, you can kind of project it onto that same discussion. And uh, it's really well written and and really worth reading uh, for people who care about this stuff. And then the third one, real quick, at the end of the year, a lot of people are kind of making their donations um, to different organizations. And there's one organization I like in the open source universe called um, the Software uh, Freedom Conservancy. And they do a lot of good work for hosting projects and providing governance for open source projects. One of the things they do that's a little controversial is they actually sue companies that aren't in compliance with open source licenses. And they're, they're, they're good about it. It's, you know, they try to negotiate and all that. But that has recently cost them some of their corporate funding. And so they're, they're in the middle of a big campaign to get, uh, more individual funders to support them. And so go take a look at Software Freedom Conservancy and, uh, you know, see if that's something you might be able to support. So those are my picks. All right. Well, if people want to know more about you, Peter, or about uh, some of the stuff that you're working on these days, where do they go? The website's great, kinoma.com, K-I-N-O-M-A.com. And I've got a a Twitter feed, which is curious, which is P-H-O-D-D-I-E. People can check that out. And of course, the Kinoma Twitter feed as well, just at Kinoma. All right. Well, thanks again for coming. This was a lot of fun to talk about. Yeah, it was great. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, we will wrap up the show. We'll catch everyone next week. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Do you wish you could be part of the discussion on JavaScript Jabber? Do you have a burning question for one of our guests? Now you can join the action at our membership forum. You can sign up at javascriptjabber.com slash jabber, and there you can join discussions with the regular panelists and our guests. 